a new paper has just recorded the oldest cooking site ever at almost 800,000 years ago. What are the details? How do we know this? And who was the first cook? is a distinctly human characteristic today, and cultures all around the world practice cooking in order to make their foods tastier and more nutritious. There is pretty definitive evidence that ancient humans practiced cooking, but also members of other hominin species, such as Neanderthals or Homo neanderthalensis. Cooking is a very nifty trick because in addition to increasing the nutritional value of many foods, it also burns off parasites and pathogens. Until now, the oldest evidence for cooking came from a cave in South Africa that was dated to 170,000 years ago. This suggests that archaic members of Homo sapiens were cooking tubers in that cave at that time period. Other than that, though, it seemed that cooking was a very recent phenomenon indeed. Until this new paper, Out of Nature, Ecology, and Evolution by Zahar and colleagues showed us that cooking actually begins much deeper into the past, nearly 800,000 years ago. And it seems as though the chef was not human or Neanderthal. Let's dive in. First and foremost, the oldest cooked meal is no longer tubers. Evidence for the cooking of fish 780,000 years ago at GBY, Israel. It makes sense that meat would be some of the first material cooked because meat, when it is cooked, is actually easier to chew and digest and there are more calories in it after the cooking process. The incorporation of meat and other animal products into the diet occurs pretty early in human evolution, beginning with Homo habilis and cut marked bones associated with its living sites. Now, interestingly enough, this is also when we start to see an increase in brain case size within the hominin lineage. This is likely because meat provides more caloric bang for your buck than fruits do and allows you to grow a bigger brain, which allows you to innovate with more tools so you can acquire more meat, so you can grow a bigger brain, so you can increase your toolbox and so on and so forth. But today we're talking about the next step of the process, cooking that meat. You gotta be pretty brainy to know how to cook. Step one, of course, is acquiring the resource that you want to cook. Step two is utilizing fire, either by harvesting it from a forest fire or making it yourself. And step three is actually cooking the food, enough so that it's safe to eat, but not too much so that it's burnt to a crisp and useless. We can theoretically propose that some of the brainier hominins were capable of cooking, but that's just a proposal until we find actual archaeological evidence that cooking has occurred. And finding that archaeological evidence, in addition to the paleontological evidence, is very difficult indeed. Because how do you actually show archaeologically that something cooked? You might think it's as simple as finding the presence of fire, either ash marks on the ceiling of a cave or evidence of a hearth. But having a fire doesn't necessarily mean something cooked, because fire has many uses. Keeping warm, for instance, or scaring away predators. So you might be thinking, maybe it's finding evidence of fire and then finding animal remains or plant remains inside that fire. Well, that's not foolproof either, because fire can be used to dispose of remains that you don't actually want to eat. So maybe it's simply being used as a way of getting rid of refuse. Anybody who's been to a bonfire in high school or college and thrown a beer can into the burning fire can attest to this. Sometimes it's just fun to throw stuff into the fire pit. But this paper very boldly claims that they have in fact found evidence of cooking fish almost 800,000 years ago. So how exactly do they make this case? It's really cool. As always, we'll start with the abstract. 
They say although cooking is regarded as a key element in the evolutionary success of genus Homo, impacting various biological and social aspects, when intentional cooking first began remains unknown. The early Middle Pleistocene site of GBY Israel has preserved evidence of hearth-related hominin activities and large numbers of freshwater fish remains. A taphonomic study and isotopic analysis revealed significant differences between the characteristics of the fishbone assemblages recovered in eight sequential archaeological horizons of Area B and natural fishbone assemblages. They go on to say, GBY, I'm just going to say GBY because that's what they call it later, this is the site in Israel, archaeological horizons exhibited low fish species richness with a clear preference for two species of large cyprinidae, these are like carp, and the almost total absence of fish bones in contrast to the richness of pharyngeal teeth. Most of the pharyngeal teeth recovered in the archaeological horizons were spatially associated with phantom hearths. Size strain, size strain analysis using X-ray powdered diffraction provided evidence that these teeth had been exposed to low temperatures, suggesting together with the archaeological and taphonomic data that the fish from the archaeological horizons of Area B had been cooked and consumed on site. This is the earliest evidence of cooking by hominins. So, wow, that's a lot. Let's dig into their methods just a little bit more after a brief introduction and see if we can't suss out exactly what they did. In the introduction, they note a few things that we've kind of already covered, but I want to give it to you in their context here. They note, although fish can be eaten raw, cooked fish are more nutritious, safer to eat, easier to digest, and when cooked by steaming or baking, but not grilling, they retain their DHA and eicosapentaenoic, eicosapentaenoic acid contents, EPA. When fish cooking first began, however, is unknown and there is no consensus as to when hominins first developed the ability to control fire and cook. There's some evidence to suggest Homo erectus already practiced controlled use of fire by 1.7 million years ago. However, evidence regarding the use of heat specifically for food preparation by Homo erectus is inconclusive and controversial. While it is likely that early fire using hominins had already cooked their food, definitive evidence of this practice has only been demonstrated to date for early Homo sapiens and Neanderthals in association with vegetal material with the earliest date of 170,000 years ago. So we just talked about this, right? The cooking of the tubers in these South African caves, and we've only seen cooking in Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. They say the drawback of most studies searching for cooking behavior in early Homo lies on their focus on recording circumstantial evidence, so charcoal, hearts, changes in bone color, bone shrinkage, surface modifications, and so on. While these characteristics may imply burning, they do not necessarily indicate cooking, which is defined as exposure of food elements to the controlled heat within a narrow range of temperatures. So, oh my gosh, how on earth are they going to figure this out? That seems like such a specific temperature range. What on earth could be their methods for like assigning these fish teeth, these, these fish material to that temperature range and suggesting that cooking has in fact occurred. I'm very excited to share with you what they did. I skipped down to the discussion real quick because they summarized their kind of sequential steps in proving their hypothesis or supporting their hypothesis really well here. They note, in the absence of proven methods upon which to rely, because this is kind of breaking ground in as far as identifying cooking in the fossil record using these methods, we conducted our research in three sequential phases, posing three major questions. One, can we discriminate between natural and cultural fish accumulations at the site? Two, can we associate the spatial distribution of the fish remains in the GBY material culture associated with controlled heat, or hearts? And three, can we identify microstructural changes in fish teeth and amyloid that may suggest cooking? Okay, so first they're trying to figure out whether or not they can differentiate between normal taphonomy or like fish dying and accumulating in the fossil record versus specific harvesting of fish and dumping of fish by some kind of cultural means. Like someone is harvesting these fish and putting them in a specific spot. Then they wanted to see if they could associate those fish remains with some kind of material culture. Like were they processed? Were they utilized in, in some kind of specific feast or meal gathering or whatever. They're basically trying to figure out if humans or some kind of human relative harvested these fish and processed them. And then three, can they identify structural changes in the remains, in this case uh, pharyngeal teeth is what they're going to be looking at, that suggests cooking. So they got their work cut out for them. Let's see what they found uh, and how they found it out. They discuss the fish remains that were found at GBY here in this section, but I really want to focus on the figures here. 
So down in figure one, relative abundances of fish remains in the GBY areas A and B by archaeological horizons, we see a cataloging of the fish species. Figure 1a here has the taxa richness on the y-axis and on the x-axis individual uh, archaeological horizons, so like the location of where they're found. So they have a definitive natural death assemblage in area A by which to compare every subsequent proposed archaeological site. So we're going to compare these proposed areas where hominins are processing fish to the natural death site and see if they differ significantly. And what they're arguing here is that Yes, there is a significant difference in the natural assemblages versus the ones proposed to be uh, hominin processing sites. And the way that they're arguing this is that there's way lower diversity in the areas that hominins are processing the fish. This makes sense because hominins pulling fish from a lake is not going to be representative of the entire biodiversity of that lake, which will be recorded in the natural assemblage of the lake. So this is pretty good. They show in figure B here the frequency percentage of, I believe, specific species, and then they do that again down here in C, where they show, oops, I jumped the gun a little bit, in C, where they show specific pharyngeal teeth of specific species and the frequency of them at each archaeological site. In figure 2a, they go in depth on these species. In the natural assemblage, we see that there is a pretty even mix of the species represented. We have a lot of cichlids here in this green color, chloriodid, chloriodids? Chloriodids. Um, in the red, we see cyprinidids, cyprinidids? Cyprinidids, yeah, cyprinidae. Yeah, cyprinidids. Small cyprinidids here in dark blue, and in the gray, large cyprinidids. And in the natural assemblage, there's very small number of large fish being recorded. A um, lot of medium and small fish, as you would suspect, right? In the proposed archaeological horizons, however, they are dominated by large cyprinidids, these big fish. Now, what the authors will propose here in a moment is that based off of the paleoecology, the lake is shallow. So if you're a hominin trying to catch fish with your hands, it's going to be easier to catch the big fish than the little fish. And that's precisely what we see. A massive bias towards large fish and the processing of large fish in these proposed hominin areas. And here's another graphic that shows kind of what these fish might have looked like. The chloriids, chlorius, looks like to be some kind of catfish. The cichlids are just like a regular old teleost. Um, and we do see this bias persisting. Cool. So it seems like their first hypothesis, can we differentiate between natural assemblages and hominin sites? They're good to go. There is a clear, significant um, diagnosis here. Okay, so next, can they associate these biased fish assemblages with hominins? And the way that they're doing this is they're taking the tool sites, the material culture sites, and basically superimposing them onto the fish remain sites that are proposed to be hominin processing sites to see if they are in the same area, because that would suggest that the guys that made the tools are the ones processing the fish. This seems like kind of a duh, you know, thing to test, but that's what science is for, is to make sure that all of our presumptions are valid presumptions before moving forward. And what you can see here is that in the red is the kernel density of flint micro artifacts. So this is evidence of a hearth, a little fire pit. And in blue is the kernel density of fish remains. And wow, side by side, you can see that these things match up pretty well. In this horizon here, three little dots of a fire site and a big old chunk of fish remains, same thing sort of um, down lower. And the sort of sample size here is really good. N equals 877 for the flint and 3,288 for the fish pharyngeal teeth. And like, yeah, that's, that's dope. That's really interesting um, and like seemingly obvious again, I, but this didn't occur to me right away. Like I wouldn't have put two and two together. Of course, I don't focus on the archeology, span archeology span being material culture of hominins, but still. So next, can we prove that the fish teeth at these processing sites, at these fire pit sites, were actually cooked and not just burned? And this is really cool. 
So first what they did is they set a baseline. So the thing about enamel is it's the hardest substance that a biological entity can produce and it records change really, really well. So the way that they created their baselines for uncooked versus cooked versus burned is they took living carp teeth, 23 fresh teeth of a black carp and exposed it to different thermal conditions, six unheated teeth, seven isolated teeth heated in a laboratory oven temperature and 10 teeth, which were like burned in a ceramic gas kiln. And they controlled the temperatures to make sure that they were getting um, you know, very precise readings. And then they compared them to the enamel structure. They record the enamel structure post burning or non burning or cooking. And then they compare that to the enamel condition that we see in these fish teeth at this proposed hominin site. That's brilliant. And here are the figures. In A are the values. So I think this is figure three. So 3A, let me double check that it's three. Figure 3a, we see the values that were set by the experimental fish. So the results for burning, moderate heat or cooking, and low heat or unheated. And then in figure b is the fossils, right? So they compare natural depth for the fossils as well. And as you can see, there are a lot of cooked fish teeth. There are also a lot of uncooked fish teeth and no burned fish teeth seemingly, but quite a bit of intentionally cooked fish teeth here. And we know that this is intentional because otherwise, if they were just being chunked into the fire pit, the majority of them would be burned, not cooked. Finally, they tested a little extra idea here in figure six, where they're looking to see if this exploitation of fish as a resource and cooking of fish is periodical, like is it seasonal or is it consistent? And they make the argument in the text here that it is indeed consistent and not seasonal, that the hominins that were living here were exploiting the fish all year round. Our contention that fish were not a seasonal supplement, but a year round dietary component is in accordance with our knowledge of other dietary components, for example, plants consumed at GBY. So let's finish this off with their discussion and the conclusion. The main aim of this study was to, turn, was to determine whether the hominins at GBY some 780,000 years ago cooked their fish. When the process of controlled use of fire for cooking by early homo began is highly contested or debated, mainly due to the rarity of sites with clear anthropogenic association between material culture and control of fire. Although many of the lower paleolithic sites are located next to aquatic habitats, the contribution of aquatic fauna to nutritional and stable diets has received little attention. This is a good point. As we saw, the, the oldest use of fire prior to this was on tubers, and we give a lot of attention to non-aquatic meats instead. The absence of proven method, methods on which to rely, we already talked about this, this was their layout of their three arguments, and they finished by basically arguing that, yeah, we showed good support for all three of our hypotheses and for the idea that this was not seasonal. They say identification of the cooking method practiced by the GBY inhabitants is indeed a challenge, especially since no traces of cooking apparatuses have been preserved at the site, nor at any other Acheulean site. Nonetheless, ethnographic and experimental studies indicate that fish cooking requires the production of low to moderate heat while preventing fast cooling or direct burning. One possibility, therefore, is that the GBY inhabitants use some kind of earth oven that maintained the temperature below 500 degrees Celsius to cook their fish. This study provides evidence of fish cooking by early hominins uh, 780,000 years ago, emphasizing the role of wetland habitats and offering a stable year-round source of food that played an important role in hominin subsistence and dispersal across the old world. So that's really cool. They made their case really well, I think. But what does this mean in the big picture sense? Because I found this study particularly interesting um, in part because they don't say who they think the hominin was. They simply say that it was the GBY inhabitants, the hominins at GBY. And I think that we have a pretty clear idea of who this is just based off of the temporal, the temporal and geographic ranges of hominins at this time, 780,000 years ago. Because this site is in Israel, and while Neanderthals were probably around, or at least beginning to be around 780,000 years ago, this would be in Eurasia. And humans evolved in Africa beginning 300,000 years ago, and we didn't leave Africa until about 60 to 70,000 years ago. So it's not Homo sapiens, and it's not Neanderthals, which leaves really only one culprit that could 
be pointed at, that the finger could be pointed at as being the chef here at GBY in Israel. And that's Homo erectus. And this makes sense because Homo erectus is, of course, the first hominin to whom fire use is assigned. But until now, consistent control use of fire by Homo erectus has not been supported. But this is a step even further. This isn't just controlled use of fire. This is controlled use of fire for something that is as, I guess, sophisticated as cooking, which seems to me to be a fairly large step in the direction of the sort of technological prowess that we'll see in later genus Homo, including later Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, and Denisovans. So this is another important piece to the puzzle of when did humans become human, as it were. And of course, as I've said many times on the channel, this is a difficult question to ask and one that I don't think can ever be truly answered. Uh, it would be like trying to figure out where red begins on the color gradient. But that being said, what this does at least tell us is that some of the very important characteristics that we deem as somewhat exclusive to humans, or at least to humans and Neanderthals, is much, much older than we thought, which is pretty sick. So thank you, my gentle and of course very modern apes for listening, and I hope to see you next time. Oh, 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 oh,